Uh, it's great to be back in Lippmann House. I'm David Sanger, and uh, as you know from uh, Emery's uh, introduction, I'm with my good friend Gary Seymour, and um, uh, we're really looking forward to this and to the program. When I first heard about this a year ago, I thought it was really a, a great idea uh, to bring everybody here, and it's great to see so many old friends here, including uh, a few like Ethan, who've had to suffer through editing me at various <laughs> moments, so, uh, and, and Ed and, and other good friends. Um, so let me tell you for just a moment about um, Gary. Um, you've got his, um, uh, his formal biography here. Um, Gary and I go back uh, a ways, uh, actually to about 1980 or 1981 when he was a 25-year-old um, graduate student here. He's now 30. And um, uh, he was teaching a, a terrific course on the Persian Gulf, uh, involving many of the same characters who are still running the Persian Gulf, or their kids are. <laughs> and uh, I took this as a junior seminar uh, here. I think we met in the Kennedy School back in those days. When the Kennedy School was, was like one building. Yeah, or it might have been Lett Tower. Was it Lett Tower? I think it was Lett Tower. Yeah. Um, so um, that was when I first got to know Gary. And then um, we went off on our different ways. I did my journalism stuff. He was off. Uh, you were at Los Alamos for a year. Livermore. Livermore for Close. a year. And you were uh, uh, getting going in, in many um, fascinating nuclear-related issues. And then... Um, we all showed up again uh, in a North Korea negotiation that followed about five North Korea crises ago. Uh, and, and then Gary went into the Clinton administration. He had the coolest office in the old executive office building. It had this fabulous balcony we would sit out at sometimes uh, that overlooked the um, West Executive Avenue and the whole West Wing and all that. And those were in days when the administration, this may shock some of you, but you know, actually encouraged policymakers at the uh, NSC to sit down and talk to reporters at length about why they were doing what they were doing. This was a long ago and far away time, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, got to know Gary's family. He took off and did lots of interesting things in London and Chicago during the Bush administration and reappeared as um, the, uh, the nuclear czar, though they wasn't allowed to use that phrase, and probably shouldn't have, for the Obama administration. Um, we had lots of interesting adventures there, uh, including when uh, uh, Stanford scientists had gone into North Korea and came out to with the discovery that they actually had built a uh, uh, uranium enrichment plant, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, and um, other moments of when we discovered ahead of time the president was about to announce a secret facility that had been in, uh, found in Iran. So we had all kinds of interesting reporter um, official uh, engagement. And I thought that after we go through some of the hot spots of the world, we talk a little bit about how that dynamic works out. Uh, but first, Gary, I know you wanted to talk a bit about um, the Belfer Center and what it's so why don't we start there, and then we'll get into the bigger discussion. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, hi to everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, this is the advertising portion of uh, the evening's events. I handed out a little one-pager that describes the main areas of nuclear research at the Belfer Center that me and my colleagues um, are engaged in. And of course, all of us would be delighted to talk to you and be quoted in your media outlets whenever possible. Um, but this is also a good way to remind you of the four major elements in the nuclear field. Uh, the first is arms control and strategic stability, which is a polite way of saying avoiding nuclear war among the nuclear armed countries. And as you all know, there are nine countries that have nuclear weapons. Uh, the US, Russia, UK, France, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea. Uh, and all of these countries are committed to retaining their nuclear weapons um, and, in fact, building up or modernizing them. So we're going to have nine, at least nine, nuclear-armed countries uh, in the world for the foreseeable future. 
If we're lucky. If we're lucky. I say at least nine. There may be more, but at least nine. With North Korea, 10. No? Oh, did I not say North Korea? You had North Korea. Yeah, no, I thought yeah. I mentioned North Korea. With North Korea, isn't it? No, yeah. five. Plus. Five declared. Oh, I you're right. I mean Thank you. Ten. Thank you very much. You're better than I am. You're going to adjust the calculus Yeah, no, no, no that's good. Ten, sorry. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, the, the policy issue for arms control and strategic stability is not only the technical details of the nuclear balance, as we'll talk about with Putin's announcement today, what kinds of weapons are deployed and what the balance of terror looks like, but it's also, I think, much more importantly about the underlying political relationship between those countries that have nuclear weapons, whether it's the US and Russia, US and China, India, Pakistan, and so forth. That's really the critical determinant. So the study, to me, is much broader than the nuts and bolts of nuclear weapons and delivery systems. The second area is nonproliferation, preventing other countries from getting nuclear weapons. And the focus there, uh, what's really changed in my career, is that nonproliferation, when I first started, it was really a global issue. So we worried about countries in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, even in Europe. Now the range of countries that might potentially pursue nuclear weapons is really just limited to Near East, to Northeast Asia and the Middle East. Northeast Asia because North Korean uh, nuclear weapons are putting pressure on Japan and South Korea to consider nuclear weapons. I don't think that's a near-term threat because there are international and domestic political obstacles, but technically those countries, of course, could build nuclear weapons quite quickly if they made the decision to do so. And in the Middle East, you also have countries like Saudi or Turkey that feel under pressure to uh, consider or pursue nuclear weapons because of Iran, even though Iran's program is currently uh, under control. Uh, under the JCPOA, everybody understands that that's a temporary fix, that it's a 10 to 15 year fix if the deal survives. And in the Middle East, as David said, things haven't changed that much uh, since we were young. Um, they have long memories, and 10 to 15 years is not a very long time. So they're thinking ahead to what happens if Iran builds nuclear weapons. But there, the constraint is much more technical as opposed to political because none of the countries in the Middle East, outside of Israel and Iran, maybe Turkey, have much of a technological base for acquiring nuclear weapons. So we'll talk about that. Third issue, nuclear security. That's preventing terrorists from acquiring nuclear materials or weapons. And you'll hear from Matt Bunn, who I think is one of the country's strongest experts in this field. How do you physically protect uh, nuclear material, weapons, uh, technology, know-how, and so forth in order to ensure that terrorists don't acquire nuclear weapons. And finally, nuclear energy. And at the Belfer Center, our focus on nuclear energy, in addition to its role in combating climate change, is what's the connection between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. And we'll talk about, we were talking, uh, you know, earlier Nathan and I about the question of U.S. nuclear cooperation with Saudi Arabia and what kind of constraints should we put on Saudi efforts to develop civilian uh, fuel cycle capabilities that also have nuclear weapons applications. So those are the four areas which I think the Belfer Center focuses on, but for all of you thinking about how to organize your approach to the subject, I think those are generally seen as the four major pillars of the nuclear field. That's great. And we'll also try to take up briefly, and if we don't ask us about it, that Belfry's got another interesting element that started up, which is, a, of course, its cyber initiative, uh, which Michael Solmeyer's um, uh, been running. Um, and there's a fascinating link between the concerns about cyber escalation and nuclear escalation, and, of course, the fear that cyber can be used to go um, manipulate your nuclear weapons, disable your missiles, and so forth. A uh, fairly big story we worked on for the better part of a year, ran last, last March, just a year ago, uh, was about the uh, US program to go after North Korea's nuclear uh, missiles and try to uh, screw up their, their testing regime. 
And so there's an interesting um, linkage there, which I've, I've been working on a, a fair bit as well. So Gary, let's start, well, let's start with today, since we've got a <coughs> room full of journalists. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been edging toward what happened today for years now. We've had Putin, since he came back into office, work on a fairly aggressive development, uh, modernization of their nuclear forces, which they needed because their nuclear forces were really in tough old Soviet shape, uh, leftover, leftover stuff. Uh, but they did that quite aggressively. Um, programs that I guess once the government considered quite secret, the US government considered quite secret, we've now begun discussing openly uh, the nuclear torpedo, the autonomous torpedo that if the Russians can ever get it going is supposed to be able to head from uh, Russia to go hit the west coast with some kind of cobalt um, warhead to it that would make the, the, the west coast even more unlivable than parts of it are today. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, uh, they've had a series of other modernizations and then once uh, President Trump came in and General Mattis looked at this from his new post at, as, at the Defense Department, he moved from somebody who thought, well, maybe we don't need all elements of the triad. We may not need our land-based uh, missiles. We can do it with submarines and with, with uh, aircraft to not only embracing the triad but embracing some new low-yield nuclear weapons and then giving a remarkable speech in January that didn't quite get the, the play it should have, where he said, you know, for a decade and a half, we have focused mostly on terrorism as the number one defense issue for the United States, and we're actually back to an era of superpower conflict. And you heard Putin refer to that speech obliquely in his statement today. So how did we get here, and whose right. fault is that? <laughs> Let me talk about how we got here first, and then we can figure out how to assign blame. In the first Obama term, I spent a lot of time with Russian diplomats and military officials um, talking about arms control, the strategic balance, negotiations of the New START Treaty. And what really struck me was the genuine Russian conviction that the U.S. was seeking to acquire a capability to preemptively destroy North Korea, uh, uh, sorry, Russia's nuclear forces, and whatever missiles survived could be mopped up with our relatively small national missile defense system. And we knew that the Russians were doing studies and making calculations which convinced them that the U.S. could be in a position uh, to really intimidate Russia by threatening a first strike of some kind. Um, I said to the Russians, this is absolutely crazy because our missile defense system is not that good and even if four or five of your nuclear warheads get through and destroy a couple of American cities, that's not going to seem like much of a victory to the United States. And it certainly wouldn't appear to be a victory to whoever was president. But the Russians are absolutely convinced that they need not only to modernize their nuclear forces, the traditional uh, land-based missiles, sea-based missiles, and bombers. They're convinced they need to have weapons to evade our missile defense system. And of course, they've been working on a variety of technologies for a long time, many years, uh, which we follow through our intelligence. So everything that Putin announced today is not new. right? These are systems the Russians have been working on for many, many years. Uh, what's new, of course, is that he made them all public and boasted about them. And I, to me, it really reveals the extent to which the Russian conviction and you know, the, hosti the overall hostility, obviously, between Moscow and Washington is much worse now because of Ukraine uh, and the Crimean uh, seizure. But the, the extent to which the Russians are you know, committed to maintain a very robust nuclear force to protect them against what they see as US strategic advantages. And because of that, I am very skeptical we're going to see any more arms control for a long time. The current New START Treaty expires in um, 2021, so in just a few years. <clears throat> and the Russians made it very clear they're not willing to accept any further reductions 
un unless the U.S. is willing to limit its missile defense system. And I don't think any president can do that because, unfortunately, uh, both North Korea and Iran continue to pursue long-range missile capabilities, and our only effective response to that threat is to build up our national missile defense. If you believe that the missile defense actually would be terribly effective, and we've got two forms here. There's the Alaska-California right. ground-based system, which has a success rate of almost 50% yeah. in some good days. Um, and then a more successful ship-based system, but that doesn't really help you against a missile from North Korea. So we're sitting, we've got, it strikes me, we've got opposite concerns. The Russians think our missile defense is too effective against a deployed arsenal of 1,550. Right. And we think it couldn't protect us against a dozen North Korean missiles launched at once. Well, of course, the story is not over with. I mean, we're going to dump a lot more money on missile defense because of North Korea. I mean, including boost phase missile defense systems. I think that this is a great time to be in the missile defense business <laughs> because Kim Jong-un, since, I, as I say, I doubt we're going to be able to stop him from proceeding to the point where he has a notional capability to attack the United States directly. And there has to be a political response to that. I think we have to be able to say that we're doing something to defend ourselves. I think we'll pour a huge amount of money into missile defense and at least against a country like North Korea, you can imagine missile defense being effective if it's linked to um, 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 you know, preemptive attacks on North Korean facilities uh, and missile sites in the context of a war. Right. Um, against North Korea, I mean against Russia or China, relatively I, I, useless. it's relatively useless unless there's some really dramatic breakthrough in a new technology. So as we talked about earlier, directed energy weapons that people are working on, maybe one day they will make ballistic missiles obsolete. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So I referred to in the introduction, Gary, that the newest thing in missile defense that you keep reading more and more about, we wrote about it in the North Korea context, which is called left of launch. In other words, trying to reduce the chances that a country could successfully launch their weapon to begin with. Um, and Obama turned to this after you had left yeah. office already because he was unhappy with the statistics he was seeing on traditional missile defense. Um, what's your estimate? How, how helpful is this? And while it might be helpful against a country like North Korea, how helpful would it be in a Russia context? Or could it be destabilizing? I, I'm very skeptical that the Russians can get into our nuclear command and control and vice versa. Because I think people are aware of the danger, and I think people have taken steps in order to try to prevent that from happening. I mean, obviously, if the pr opportunity presented itself, and we could actually uh, you know, manipulate the Russian or Chinese or North Korean um, system for command and control, we would do it. We would take advantage of it. But, but I'm just know it. You wouldn't know, know for sure that you could do it, that your implants in those systems work exactly. until the day came, you wouldn't be willing That's to right. ro roll those, that dice. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I don't think I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously people work on these things, but I think that physical missile defense is probably, you know, where we're going to put most of our money That's to respond to the North That's Korea threat. One more on Russia. So um, there's one school of thought that the speech that Putin gave today and this whole effort is actually more about domestic politics than it is about defense. That he's got to appear to have an enemy, he's got to appear to be defending the state, he's got to appear to be rebuilding what the Soviet Union had. He was the one who said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest um, uh, tragedy of the, uh, of the 20th century, uh, or geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. Um, how much of this could just be smoke and mirrors? Well, I don't know the latest US intelligence estimates. But at least when I was looking at these weapon systems, these exotic weapon systems, I thought they were a colossal waste of money. Because I think there are much more cost effective ways to defeat US missile defense than you know, large autonomous uh, nuclear torpedoes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as I understand it, the Russians 
have not really been able to perfect a lot of these weapon systems. So I think a certain, a certain amount of this is bluster. Um, and I'm also, you know, as I've said, I think the Russians have a deep conviction about the danger to their strategic forces. And I'm sure they're very unhappy that Trump has basically decided to continue Obama's program to rebuild our strategic forces. They're very worried about the you know, accuracy of our submarine launch missiles in particular, which would have incredibly short warning time. And you know, people have tried to do calculations to show how much of Russia's nuclear forces we could wipe out in a bolt out of the blue, which is insane because we'd never do that. But it's actually, from Russia's standpoint, it's actually pretty scary because most of their nuclear forces are uh, silos. Mm -hmm. They're fixed land-based positions which are vulnerable to a preemptive attack. And that's why the Russians, when they do their calculations, they're very nervous about how many of their 1,550 strategic warheads would actually survive a first American attack. Now, when you were, um, just after you uh, left and, and came up here, it was a fascinating proposal that was put out by Haas Cartwright, who, of course, had been the uh, head of strategic command and critical in both cyber and in nuclear uh, territory which he basically argued that even if you didn't get the agreement of the Russians, we could still go down to about 800 weapons, move them around yes. uh, well enough that their exact location at any given time was unclear. And so we could do sort of a unilateral cut. Obama didn't buy it. He didn't think politically he could get away with doing a cut if the Russians didn't. What's your thinking on that? Well, I think, first of all, you're right, that the military, there was, a ve I thought, a very strong argument that was the military made to Obama that we don't need the New START numbers, that because our weapons, unlike the Russians, are so much more mobile, because our, most of the US strategic forces are submarine-based, so they're not in danger of being destroyed uh, in a first strike, that we could afford to reduce our numbers. And Obama thought, even pre-Ukraine, that that was just not politically sustainable. That a unilateral cut that would, on the surface, move us below parity with the Russians was impossible. After Ukraine, it was ridiculous to even think about it. I mean, Putin has been the best friend of the US nuclear weapons industry you could imagine. Right? He's made nuclear weapons very, very fashionable again, strengthened arguments for not only modernizing the triad, but developing new types of nuclear weapons. And if you look at the Trump nuclear posture review, which, as I said, is not dramatically different from Obama's, but to the extent that it's different, it's blamed on Russia and blamed on Russian behavior in Europe in particular. So this goes to your question about who's at fault. I think it's very hard to answer the question. I'm sure there's fault on both sides. But I do think the, I, I, you know, I am deeply convinced that the fact that Russia got to the cusp of being a liberal, democratic, law-abiding country and then slipped back into a corrupt, um, autocratic system has a lot to do with the reason why U.S.-Russian relations have reached this resumption of the Cold War. So I do think that the, the fundamental reason for, and again, both sides made mistakes, I think the fundamental reason is that Russia has, has reverted to a paranoid dictatorial state. Not to be, not to be too, put too fine a point on it. <laughs> um, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> There's somebody who actually knows something about it. Um, let's um, turn briefly to North Korea. Um, so uh, if there's one place in the world that people think we could end up in conflict, uh, this is it. We had a story this morning in the Times about a tabletop exercise that the military <coughs> ran. They do these periodically uh, about, and I, I think that the reason that we got so much detail about that was you had a lot of commanders who wanted the leadership of the United States to know that this was going to be incredibly ugly, right. incredibly high casualties, and was uh, not doable. Um, at the same time, um, <clears throat> it, the, the voices of moderation in the administration 
on this are pretty few. Tillerson, who is not in the strongest position. Mattis has been very, very concerned about it, and he probably would be the, 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 the biggest one, the, the most influential one in throwing himself in the way of it. So um, tell us where you think we stand. What is a reasonable thing to try to negotiate and hope for on the assumption from your earlier statement yeah. that convincing them to give up their weapons is, we're way past that. <clears throat> So, you know, I agree with Trump that he's been handed a rotten hand, that for 30 years the U.S. has failed to prevent North Korea from developing nuclear weapons. And we've tried all the tools available, whether it's sabotage or export controls or sanctions or diplomacy or military threats. We've tried all of these instruments and none of them have worked. And I think we're past the point where we have an effective military option. The only way to really be certain of removing North Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles is to invade and occupy the country and destroy the regime. That's how we were successful in Iraq, right? I mean, Saddam Hussein was a big threat uh, to proliferate nuclear weapons. We don't worry about Iraq building nuclear weapons anymore. Why? We destroyed the country um, for all intents and purposes. So that's where we are with North Korea. And to carry out that kind of a big attack would, would uh, consume so many resources and would pose such a threat, especially to our South Korean and Japanese allies, now that uh, North Korea has you know, nuclear weapons that can probably be delivered by ballistic missiles in the region, I just don't see our allies being willing to go along with that kind of an attack. And in particular, for us to do it, you know, we can't do that from aircraft carriers, right? You've got to move a couple of hundred thousand troops onto the Korean Peninsula in order to carry out such, a, such an attack and invasion. And I don't think South Korean Moon Jae-in is going likely to uh, give us permission to uh, move our forces into South Korea. So the other that, so that's sort of the really solve the problem by destroying North Korea. That's a very high price to pay. The other theory is people have called the bloody nose theory, that we'll do something punitive to show Kim Jong-un that we're really serious. So the model here is the attack against Assad after he delivered chemical weapons, right? But it's not going to make much of a military impact, but the intent is to change Kim Jong-un's calculation. We can do that. Right? We can destroy an isolated missile facility. We might even be able to destroy a test missile on the launch pad. Or we can destroy the barge they're using to, to test their, you know, under, their you know, underwater missiles. So we, we can carry out a targeted, limited attack that might not even kill anybody. But the risk is tremendously high because uh, Kim Jong-un, unlike Assad, has options to retaliate. Right? We can attack Syria with, with impunity. Syria can't do anything against us or our allies. But Kim Jong-un has got a lot of options to retaliate in ways that are difficult for us to respond to, in part because of Seoul's vulnerability to attack. So I think if you play that game, you know, we hit him, what does he do to hit us back? It becomes you know, a very risky proposition and it's not clear that that kind of pinpoint attack is really going to make much of a difference. I mean, Assad is still using chemical weapons, despite the fact that, uh, that Trump bombed him. And I think there are lots of things that North Koreans could do to change their you know, uh, launch operation so that we would not have the ability to preemptively destroy uh, missiles on the launch pad. So for me, it's a high risk for very little gain. And again, you face the problem of how do you carry out such an attack without the concurrence of our allies in Korea or Japan, who are the ones who would suffer the most if it all goes wrong. And we knew much more about Iraq before we went in. Very even, good point. Even <clears throat> though we missed the key element, which right. was what they were building. Right. In North Korea's case, we have terrible satellite coverage of it. Uh, they've classified the exact amount, but yeah. people have indicated to me it's under 30% you know, the time. Yeah. So they could be moving missiles around, you'd never see it, yeah. right? Well, yeah, I mean, that's why I say the only way, because we cannot pinpoint attack, the only way to destroy the arsenal is to invade and occupy the country. 
even that, you wonder how many they would be able to shoot off in the last well, few hours. Yeah. This is the risk, that, that you would try to destroy as many as you can, but if only a few survive, that does a lot of damage to Tokyo or Seoul. So let's go look for a moment at the negotiation side yes. of this. So the um, administration keeps digging itself in the same hole, which is the only outcome here is a completely denuclearized right. Korean Peninsula. Yeah. Um, if they got offered a freeze for a freeze, essentially freezing the North Korean development where it is now, which is right on the cusp of proving that mm -hmm. they can reach the United States, in return for us doing something, maybe s slowing down or stopping our military exercises, maybe something else. Um, first of all, how much would that help? How much would it enshrine North Korea's current capability? And would Trump take that deal? So I, you know, I've said to my friends in the Trump administration, you've done a great job of building up pressure. I mean, very skillfully working with the Chinese to uh, increase international sanctions more than they've ever been before, in large part because Kim Jong-un's testing campaign really infuriated Beijing. But we took advantage of that. We've worked with the Chinese to increase the economic pressure. We've done unilateral sanctions that have helped to bolster enforcement of those international sanctions. So we've got some real bargaining leverage. And I think if the Trump administration was willing, they could use that bargaining leverage to get some constraints on North Korea's nuclear and missile program. I don't think they can eradicate it. I don't think we have enough leverage to compel Kim Jong-un to give it up. But I think we have enough leverage to at least get some limits. And they may very well be temporary, because we know any deal with North Korea is not likely to last too long. Um, but to me, that's a reasonable outcome. It's probably the best we can do. And the more time you buy by delaying the program, the more we can invest in missile defense and other forms of deterrence in order to protect ourselves against what I think is inevitable, as long as the North Korean regime survives. But to answer your question, I just don't see much evidence the Trump administration is capable of negotiating in a realistic way. I mean, I think we've, you know, have, they're very short on personnel. And Joe Yun, who was the special representative for North Korea, is resigning on Friday, yep. tomorrow. So the most experienced person is not even going to be there to help Tillerson. Um, and I think there are real, um, you know, within the administration, I think there are some people who've witnessed how, um, uh, how unproductive it is to negotiate with North Koreans since they cheat or renege on any deal. And they're determined not to make that mistake again. So the only deal they would accept is complete disarmament, which is not realistic. Um, as, as Trump's aides describe it to me, one of the biggest problems is his own rhetoric here. So January 2nd of last year, just before he got inaugurated, he tweeted out after Kim Jong-un said he would build missiles that could reach the United States, he said, not going to happen. Right. And I had somebody fairly senior in the administration last summer when the fire and fury lines were coming out and all that say to me, you know, David, every time you publish a repeat of what the president said in those tweets, he said, you make our life harder because he reads it and he says, I'm not doing what the last guys did. I'm not doing anything partial. Um, and I can understand his frustration there because as you said yourself, each one of these incremental decisions we made was perfectly reasonable in the yep. moment. And none of them worked. And none, if you add them up over 25 years, yep. you get the North Korea you've got today. That's what I say to my North Koreans. The one th my North Korean friends, I say, the one thing you've really achieved is that you've complete, completely discredited negotiations with you. <laughs> because we've had three deals, right? I mean, Clinton, Bush, and Obama all had nuclear deals with North Korea. All of them collapsed. Right. Because the North Koreans the Obama one lasted day. only days. Yeah, so well, weeks. But weeks. weeks but yeah. Yes, it was a record, even for the North Korea. That's right. But I do think that um, you know, because we don't have any other very good options, and because Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president, is taking advantage of the situation to push forward, I think it's at least possible that the Trump administration will recognize that they need to at least try whether they're very serious or not, they at least have to try to get a real negotiation started.
And at the end of the day, that may prolong the current moratorium on testing. I mean, my biggest concern is that even if we got into a real negotiation with the North Koreans where we were willing to trade sanctions relief for uh, significant constraints on North Korea's nuclear and missile program, I don't know how to work out a verification system that would be acceptable. I mean, we would need to have, because North Korea, as you said, has facilities scattered all around, hidden all around the country, we'd have to have a pretty intrusive on the ground inspection system in order to satisfy ourselves that they were actually living up to the agreement. And the North Koreans have never been willing to accept that kind of inspection regime. So part of me thinks the best you can do is a temporary moratorium on testing. Right. Whose tests you would see? But yeah, we um, can verify that yeah. independently. So if you were the North Koreans and you're looking at this, and then you're watching the debate going on within the administration about the Iran deal, mm -hmm. and the conversation there would go a little like, well, supposing we negotiate with these yeah. awful <coughs> Americans, OK, and we strike a deal with them. Doesn't Iran prove that one president will not necessarily feel bound by the yeah. commitments of the last? Yes, but the North Koreans, if there was an agreement, they would enter the agreement in bad faith. I mean, there would never be any intent. Mm -hmm. I mean, the North Koreans don't trust us, right? right. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter how we behave. They're quite confident that uh, the, the, any deal is temporary, right. right? I mean, what Kim Jong-un is looking for is sanctions relief without making any concessions that would fundamentally uh, limit his nuclear options. So as you read the Iran deal uh, debate right, right now, um, the president has asked the Europeans to come up with a plan, not necessarily to reopen the deal, but to negotiate something alongside it. And for one element of this, the missile side, I could imagine doing that because missiles aren't covered by the right. 2015 agreement. They're covered by a UN resolution. But everything else, as you and I have discussed before, would essentially require you to go reopen this, which means the Iranians are going to turn around and say, well, while it's open, we have a few more things we'd like. Yeah. Well, I, you know, first of all, I think that Trump is right, that the agreement could be better, obviously. And the things he's identified as limits in the agreement are concessions that were made in order to get the deal. Uh, the risk here is that by reopening the deal, you may uh, end up having a, a renegotiation that fails and the deal collapses. And the benefit we're getting of constraining Iran's program for 10 to 15 years would, you know, would evaporate at a time when we're trying to confront Iran and a number of other areas in the Middle East. I thought Trump's, you know, um, in January, when he waived the U.S. sanctions, he made an ultimatum to the Europeans and said, if you don't agree to join me in fixing the flaws in the agreement, I'm not going to waive sanctions again. Well, that, I, I, I think it's a risk for the president to put himself in that kind of a situation because for the U.S. to unilaterally renege on the agreement without the support of our allies would put us in a very weak position to try to restore the sanctions regime. And if the Iranians then respond by, uh, you know, by resuming their nuclear program, Trump's going to face a question of whether or not to use military force. And I'm not sure he's particularly anxious to get into another war in the Middle East. Particularly when you're considering the possibility of one in Asia. Yes, exactly. So I think he's put himself in a very difficult position. But I believe that, as you, you know, reported um, uh, I think on Monday in the, in, in the paper, I think the Europeans will work out something with the State Department that's close enough to allow Trump to declare victory and waive the sanctions for another 120 days. Um, the question for the Europeans is they want to agree with Trump that at some point we want to address the weaknesses in the agreement, but we don't want to engage in a time-bound renegotiation now because that will very quickly run into a brick wall and fail, and that could give Trump a justification for uh, pulling out of the deal. I was at the Munich Security Conference, and basically the way it was sold to us by the Europeans was they want to do the absolute minimum possible to keep Trump from getting out of the deal, and then get a process going that will go on forever, yes, or at forever least. being defined as <laughs> the 15 years right. or now 13 years right. it would take to be wrong. Right. 
And the, truth is, and, and the truth is, all of Trump's foreign policy team is conspiring with the Europeans to bring about this outcome. That's right. Because everybody thinks the idea of us walking away from the deal without cause is utter stupidity. One of Trump's very close aides said to me that their objective was to keep the president from having to actually sign any pieces of paper that extend the sanctions relief or anything like that. He doesn't think about this except when these 90 or 120 day deadlines roll around. So if you can simply just keep it from coming up. So they're trying to get Congress to go renegotiate it so he doesn't have to recertify this <coughs> and think that that would actually be something of a solution. Well, Gary, let me take you to the last topic before we open it all up, which is, um, as I alluded to at the beginning, you worked for an administration where you were actually like encouraged to take lengthy phone calls from David Sanger and Bill Broad and your <laughs> colleagues. And it probably made you late to dinner more than <laughs> once. And I apologize in, in retrospect to, uh, to your wife and to your daughter. Um, and we would talk all the time. And then uh, when you got into the, uh, to the Obama administration for the first year or so, we talked. And then they dropped you into the witness protection program. <laughs> um, so talk a little bit about that dynamic, yeah. why they thought what the merits were of the other two, apart from your personal convenience, yeah. uh, not having to go uh, deal, deal with us on all of this, and how you think it affected how well all of us as reporters actually wrote about this stuff. Yeah. So as you said, uh, in the Clinton administration, I was in the White House in the second term, the National Security Advisor, Sandy Berger, encouraged me to background reporters. And you know, my job was not to be quoted on the record. My job was not even to spin. It was to explain the issues, right? And I spent a lot of time just talking on background about what the issues were. It's sort of an educational role more than you know trying to shape the story. Actually, gather six or seven of us together in some conference room. Yeah, now I I mean I don't know if it did much good, but it sort of felt like we were you know contributing to public education on these difficult issues. Um, I don't know why the Obama administration decided to be so much more restrictive, but as you know, there was a process that, you know, if any reporter contacted us, we had to refer them to the public relations office, and then if we were ever given permission to background a reporter, there had to be somebody from the press office there to take notes. And that actually got worse as the administration went yeah. on. You were just there in the first term. Yeah. It went from strict to ridiculous by the second term. I mean, to me, that's not an effective way to deal with the press. And even though you know the liberal media was generally uh, you know supportive of Obama, I think it probably ended up making their life more difficult because the press doesn't like being completely cut out of uh, <laughs> talking to officials. We we get cranky. <laughs> um, so um, do the role reversal for a minute. If you were sitting in the kind of jobs that we have. What kind of thing would you be digging into that you're not reading enough mm. about? Boy, that's a good question. I mean, I think that, that uh, you know, to me, to the extent that you can work on it, it's not easy. But I think the, the nuclear weapons programs of foreign countries are very interesting. And so, you know, the Chinese are modernizing their program, the Indians, the Pakistanis are modernizing their program. There's probably nothing you can write about Israel because nobody will talk about it. But I think there's a lot of interesting things going on in the nuclear world, which is not just, you know, what North Korea is doing right. or Iran's doing. And it does, gets almost no coverage. You've done a few things, but. Uh, well, we spent a year on the Pakistani little. program because of AQ Khan, but yeah. that's because you had a renegade who was busy selling. Right selling parts of this uh, out to the rest of the world. Um, one of the other hard parts about this is, you know, if you're at the Times or the Journal or the Washington Post or something, there are resources that will let you go off and spend a year on a hard story on this or six months or something like that. Most news organizations aren't going to do that these days. Mm. And we've even seen, because we were sort of, in, as Anne-Marie suggested in the opening here, we went through this period of 15 or 20 years where people sort of thought, well, this is not a front burner issue. Right. And we've solved that pretty well in the past <laughs> year. Yes. Uh, but um, uh, how do you persuade 
for all of us here, if you have to go back and you're talking to your editors, how do you persuade a news organization to actually put significant resource into this? Yeah. What's the best argument? I, I, well, I mean, it's a problem that's not going to go away, and it could kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> Start. <laughs> I mean, I do think, I, you know, I mean, in this business, in the nuclear business, I, I think there's always a risk of being alarmist, I mean, of exaggerating the threat, right? And I've tried, as you know, in my career, I've tried not, I've tried not to be complacent, but I've tried to be moderate, because I do think the risk of nuclear annihilation is actually pretty small. I mean, I tell people if I thought there was a significant risk, I'd be living in Maine right now. I would not be living in Cambridge. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's one of those, you know, low likelihood, but extremely high consequence uh, risks that we live with. <laughs>